It's time for some straight talk. The big wireless companies charge a boatload for their superior network coverage. But guess what? Straight Talk uses the same cell towers, but you pay half the cost. Who knew? Well, now you do. And I do. So let's do something. It's time to switch to Straight Talk. Unlimited plans start at just 45 bucks a month on America's largest, most dependable networks. Straight Talk Wireless. Only at Walmart. Savings may vary. Please refer always to the latest terms and conditions of service at straighttalk.com. This is the best of Mike and Mike podcast. Mike podcast. Subscribe now by going to the Listen tab in the ESPN app. The best of Mike and Mike. Great to have you with us here on Mike and Mike. Alongside Mr. Golick, I'm Adnan Burke in for Greeny. We're Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. As always, we are presented by Progressive Insurance. All of our phone guests in the shell, Penzoil Performance Line, and glory hallelujah, free at last. Finally, we're going to have the NBA Finals, Mike. Our, our long national nightmare is finally over. We're going to get basketball, meaningful basketball, competitive basketball again. I'm so happy about that. I'm so Because, <laughs> I mean, the amount of talk going into it, and, and I say this from, from a talk show side, we had other things to discuss, thankfully. Unfortunately, they weren't the prettiest things in the world. Correct. You know, to be talking about with stuff, you know, fights on the baseball field, certainly the Tiger Woods situation, which we'll get into again. But there were other things to talk about. But now it is going to be full on. And and I guess it, it, it's kind of like the Super Bowl because you get two weeks. And it almost felt like you got two weeks here. <laughs> right. But you have two weeks to build up to the Super Bowl. And you're like, can it live up to the hype? You know, you finally got to the Super Bowl. Can it live up to the hype? Well, this has been building since July 4th, you know, in the Hamptons when Kevin Durant is, is taking visitors, mm-hmm. you know, and meeting with teams and, and going to Golden State. that We basically knew this was going to be the matchup, and it was like, okay, will it live up? And then you end up getting a playoffs where the two teams go 24-1, and one, right. so they're not really pushed, so you're like, man. And, and that's one of the things I asked Adam Silver yesterday, you, the, the commissioner of the NBA, do you think – there's added pressure, mm-hmm. and, and he, he said no. I, I would expect he would have uh, for the NBA to say, man, we, we really need a competitive finals here because these two teams just steamroll their way there. Yeah, I was about to say, when you're doing a talk show, 20 hours of talk radio, yeah. you need to have topics, and God forbid if this isn't a competitive finals because oh I think we, we've all earned now oh, some sensational games. You're not kidding. Good to see you with the family in Cleveland, by the way. Yeah, that was fun. Always always a great trip to get back to Cleveland. Had some good weather there, so I uh, really like that, and and I hope the curse that Green and I have had on Cleveland doesn't happen. We'd go there, do a show. The Indians would be playing well, and then they'd fall off the, the map. So right. they're right there at the, you know, tied at the top of the division or right in that area. I know they lost uh, last night. But uh, let's let's hope they continue to do well and we don't jinx them so they can get back to the World Series And again. Terry Francona was there. It came up on his scooter. Came up on his scooter, which he calls the hog. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I felt bad because Greeny always talks about riding his moped. And when he wrote it, wrote it with his group of friends at 16 years old, they call themselves the Mopac, mm. which, again, just solidifies the loser in him. I can picture uh, that visual. Yeah, but yeah. here comes, here comes, you know, Tito on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a scooter. And I'm like, dude, you know, but right. he only lives two blocks from there. And he said right. it's very convenient. But it's just pretty funny when we're sitting there doing the show and, and knowing that Frank Cohn is supposed to be there. You just see a scooter go by <laughs> with the manager of the Cleveland Indians out of going, he'll be, he'll be on in just a minute as soon as he parks the hog. <laughs> he's the best at not taking himself yeah, too yeah, seriously. Yeah, he's great. He is. And we all will love Tito. All right, let's do a little off the top. Off the top. The top. What everyone's talking about brought to you by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. The Warriors host the Cavs game one tonight, 9 o'clock Eastern on ABC. It might be the most anticipated NBA Finals in history. First time in the four major pro sports that teams meet the championship after splitting the finals the previous two years. And as Mike mentioned, it combined 24 and 1 this postseason. That is the fewest combined losses entering the finals under the current playoff format going back to 1984. You got seven All Stars uh, starting this game. That's the most uh, since the finals in 1983. You have a team in the Warriors with the best scoring margin in the postseason. You have the Cavaliers with the most efficient offense in the postseason. That all being said, it's probably going to come down to defense on both sides of how they do. And something does have to give. You know, Golden State is on a 12-game winning streak, obviously winning all 12 coming up to this game. And the Cavaliers are on a nine-game road postseason winning streak. Mm -hmm. Something's got to give. 
<laughs> Off the top. The top. Set the table with drama. I love it. When he steps on the court tonight, LeBron will be the seventh player in NBA history and only non-Celtics player to play in seven straight NBA finals. James's teams, they have lost game one of the finals in each of the last five years, but have rebounded to win three of those series. So if you're a Cavs fan, don't get too panicky if they lose tonight in game one, which... I would think they would on the road in Oracle against Golden State. Yeah, I wouldn't get too panicky either. Remember, LeBron James is now the leading scorer in postseason history. Now we're looking at the finals. Where is he there? Right now he's 367th. He's 64 points behind Sam Jones, so he'll get six. If he, if the, if the series goes six or seven games in that area and he averages like 30 points, he'll end up third. He'll pass Sam Jones, Bill Russell, Elgin Baylor, and Michael Jordan, who is third. Yeah. He would then only trail Kareem, and the leader is Jerry West. He would actually need – Jerry West has 1,679 finals points, and, and uh, LeBron has 600 less. So LeBron would probably need three more finals, including this one, three, mm. to be the top all-time as fine as final scorers. Uh, amazing to think what he's already done and still would need to do to be yep. matching those guys. Off the top. The top. This is great news. If you're a Warriors fan, if you're a basketball fan, Steve Kerr may coach the Warriors in game one of the finals tonight, according to ESPN's Ramona Shelburne. Kerr has been battling the after effects of back surgery he underwent nearly two years ago, has not been on the sidelines for Golden State since game two of their first round series against Portland. He hasn't been well enough to be on the sidelines, but he has taken yeah. part in practices, travel with the team, halftime messages. This would be an awesome sight. And that's obviously the key. It's not like he's just jumping right back into it from, from his bed at home, you know. Right. He's been traveling with the team, as you just said. He's been at practices, talking to the team at halftime. So he's working his way back up to feel confident. Because I know while his health is the most important thing and has to be, certainly in his mind, he doesn't want – he didn't want to come back before he knew he could come back and stay back. Right. For him, I'm sure he doesn't want to come back a game or two and then like, oh, I feel bad again and now i got to leave. Right. You know, he wanted to come back on a consistent level, and, and hopefully it can be. Hopefully that gets squared away because that's the most important thing. A guy in his 50s mm-hmm. not wanting to live with that kind of pain for the rest of his days. I remember talking to Antonio Davis about it, and I said, how important is it? And he said, you know what? In the grand scheme of things, if the Golden State Warriors are running away with it, as they have been, probably not a big deal. But if it's a close game late, yeah. Steve Kerr knows his personnel right. knows what play to draw up. So we'll see. Mike Brown, though, has done a nice job, obviously, filling in. Off the top. Off the top. Hockey news last night. Penguins beat the Predators 4-1 to take a commanding 2-0 series lead in the Stanley Cup final. Rookie Jake <laughs> Gensel led the way again. A couple of goals, including the game winner for the second straight game in the series. Gensel is the first player since Mario Lemieux in 1992 to score the game-winning goal in each of the first two games of the Stanley Cup final series. I feel for the Preds, Mike. As a hockey fan, I want a competitive finals. Yeah. And through two periods, it's 1-1. The Preds were on pace for 50 shots. In my estimation, I think they've outplayed the Penguins in this final, except for the key position, that is goalie. And that is goalie. And, and uh, uh, Pekka Rene, who, who had been playing so well in the postseason, his last four starts against Pittsburgh, he's given up at least four goals in those starts. So it hasn't gone well there. Right. Gensel, you talked about the 22-year-old. He was a third-round pick of Pittsburgh in 2013. He's 22. He looks 15, but the dude is absolutely <laughs> On fire right now. He has 12 goals in the postseason. That's second all time to Dino Cicerelli, who scored 14 in 1981. And let me tell you, there were the same amount of penalties in the first period of that game last night as there was in all of game one. Mm -hmm. It was a physical game. 1 1, as you mentioned, going into third, and then boom, 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 out go the lights. Three goals to start the third within three minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's all she wrote. And I'm going to tell you, there was a moment in that game last night because hockey players, I said it, they are the toughest. I think the toughest athletes on the face of the earth. I know with the MMA and other rugby and all that, there's a lot of tough ones out there. Sure. There was a shot. There was a five on three for the Predators, and P.K. Subban took a shot at the top. I mean, a a absolute rocket slap shot. And you know how these defenders will drop down in front of the puck before it even gets to the goalie? Mm -hmm. Well, Nick Bonino, he kind of knelt down so it would try and hit him in the thigh where where the pad is, but the, the foot that was showing the puck went directly into the side of his ankle where there's no padding or anything. I'm telling you, he hit the deck. He had to get helped up. He was almost using his his stick like a cane, could put no pressure on it, wasn't using it at all going off the ice. But, of course, he came back. (laughs) I mean, these guys, I started to think, where's the worst spot to get hit with a puck? 
Obviously, there's a lot of pain outside of the face or, you know, the head. Right. Uh, uh, where, where you get hit without padding that it's going to hurt the most. Just think of that bone or right on the inside of your ankle that all that was there was obviously, the, you know, the, the skate that was he was wearing. Right. And took a hard sh- shot right in the inside of the ankle. Man, did that look like it hurt. Yeah, you get kicked in the ankle, that's already painful. Oh. Vulcanized rubber at 100 <laughs> miles an hour from P.K. Subban? Yeah. Forget about oh, it. Oh, that was something. And by the way, a fight, P.K. Subban and Evgeny Malkin had a fight, which I said, oh my goodness, this is going to be great. Yeah. More of yeah. a hug it that's out. Kind here. of a hug it out. Than, yeah, yeah, more like a baseball fight, unfortunately. Well, I shouldn't say that because right. Bryson Strickland did throw a few punches. <laughs> and and he, by the way, I also saw P.K. Subban guaranteeing victory, although yes, he did. Drew Brooks, our producer, pointed out, if you saw it, he said it was more of a prediction than a guarantee basically you said we're going back home we're going to win the next game then we'll go from there it's more the category mike of what else is going to say rather than well, what's he going to say yeah we're down. going to go back home for our first finals game and lose i mean what do you think he's going to say yeah exactly. nashville is going to be rocking so yep. I look forward to the series turning around off the top the and lastly top. mike mentioned bryce harper his suspension reduced from four games to three started serving his three-game suspension as the nationals face the giants on wednesday night eligible to return on sunday against the a's Hunter Strickland's suspension of six games remains unchanged at this point. Strickland hit Harper in the hip with a pitch in the eighth inning, and Harper charged the man. What do you think? Do you think that was enough? Do you, I mean, because a lot of people are saying Strickland, you know, instigates this with the hit. Yeah. He gets the six games, but it's really maybe, what, three or four innings? Right. And he got 36 innings. Well, now you have 27 innings uh, that, that Bryce Harper is going to be out. What I liked about it was the fact that normally the guy who charges the man gets more. So I like the fact Harper got less than Strickland. But perfectly to your point, I do wish it would be even because you're right. Strickland is a reliever. That's a few innings. Harper's 36 right. innings. Right. Well, now it'll be 27 innings and, you know, 15 at bats. But, yeah, I would have liked to see if they really want to send a message. Hunter Strickland, 10 games. Yeah. Bryce Harper, two games. Yeah. But regardless, I- I'm happy for Bryce. He stuck up for himself, and I guess if Hunter Strickland feels like two and a half years later, he got his revenge on this guy. Yeah, that one was a big, a bit of a stretch, and I was happy to hear the baseball guys even said that was a bit of a stretch yes. there. And, and also, by the way, one of the worst helmet throws of all time <laughs> by Bryce Harper. Yeah, I like the fact they had that side-by-side with 50 cents first pitch. Oh, yeah. The Mets game. <laughs> that was good. Which one was worse? Let us know. <laughs> Mike and Mike. Off the top. Off the top. All right, so that is off the top. Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance. Our guest list for today, Mike Golick Jr., is coming up 20 minutes from now. Scott Scotty Pippen at 7.30, Rick DiPietro talking hockey at 8, and Brian Windhorst at 9. All phone guests join us in the Shell Pencil Performance Line. If you miss any of those guests, you can listen to all four hours of Mike and Mike on demand on the ESPN app. Adnan Verkin for Greeny alongside Golick. We're Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. We talked a little bit of the nuts and bolts of the NBA Finals, but unfortunately, Mike, a sad yeah. story off the court, and that was involving LeBron James and his house being vandalized. And this is yet another reminder that just because he's a superstar athlete, mm-hmm. he is not immune to what life is like for an African-American in this country. And LeBron's saying after it, he's just glad his family is safe, but hopes that his incident on the eve of the NBA Finals sheds a light and keeps the conversation going. According to police, an unidentified person spray-painted the N-word on the front gate of LeBron James's Brentwood home, and he's obviously obviously not there right now. He's focusing on trying to win and play, but police are investigating it as an act of vandalism and possible hate crime, and I don't know anybody who wouldn't echo these sentiments. It's just horrible to see. Well, it really is, and and to the point, and, and we'll hear LeBron in a second, but yeah. th- him exactly saying that is basically, you know, it doesn't matter your stature, the money you have, or, or anything, you know, that, right. that uh, you know, the African Americans are, are, have been being the way they're being treated and he talked about that and and i i thought he handled it extra again for someone who has right. no idea of that situation right you know at all it sure sounded and from what others have said that he handled the situation extremely well you mentioned he spoke to rachel nichols let's take a listen to what some of what lebron said surprising no um because i understand i still understand how race plays a huge part in america and um, for me to be sitting here on the eve of the finals, one of the biggest sporting events in the world, and I have to answer questions about racism, um, it just lets me know that that is still here, and, and we should all know that. And and if it takes for someone to spray paint my gate and use that derogatory term, that hate on um, on my family to shed a light on what the real issue is in the world, then so be it. And I think, and I sit here and say that I believe that's why, you know, women like Emmett Till's mom left the casket open and showed everybody in the world what her son went through mm-hmm. because of hate, you know. So 
you know, I look at it and um, and it hurts and it's like unfortunate and I got to sit here and I got to talk to my kids about what it means to grow up being an African-American, a black kid in America. Um, if that can shed light on the whole situation and we can continue the conversation uh, because no matter how, no matter how much money you got, no matter how famous you are, no matter how many people admire you, at the end of the day, being a black man in America is, uh, is very frightening and it lets us know that we got so much farther, so much further to go to be equal in this, in this country. I mean, to, to hear that last part, and I mean, is there anybody that, that, that's risen the way he has and, and is admired by so many people and is as big a star? We just did the, the top 100, Hembo, uh, from around the world, correct, of between social media and money and popularity, and LeBron was second, correct? Right, Ronaldo sec- number one. Yeah, yeah, second in, in the world, I mean, to be that, that of that stature and this, you know, happened to him. So it's, it, it, again, something I can't relate to, mm-hmm. you know, at, at all. Where I grew up, it was in, in Willow, Oak, Ohio, it was all, all basically all white. I mean, I, uh, but then going into high school, it was St. Joe's, and now it's Villa Angela, St. Joe's, where I first started. Mm-hmm. And, and I always loved the breakdown of, of, of my uh, good friend Bill Curry mm-hmm. and his talk of the huddle, you know, of different races, religions, and yes. everything that go in a huddle. And that, and that was basically my life from high school on, between high school, college, in the NFL of being, you know, w- with everybody. And it was, you know, it was just another day. It was normal to me. That's why it always blows my mind that mm-hmm. the hate that some people have, you know, I, uh, it, seeing it from where I was able to see it, but getting to know a lot of the players that I knew who were African-American. And when you get to know them better and better, you hear more and more some of their stories of when they had situations like that. But then as, as I think, you know, he said, listen, if it's going to happen to me and it's can shed light and, and open eyes and make people talk more about it, right. then, you know, you try and if you can grab anything of the glass half full or positive out of it, I know that sounds weird to say, but mm-hmm. that's kind of where LeBron was going to say, hey, if it keeps the conversation going. And he's been a guy, Mike, unafraid to put himself out there. When it yeah. comes to social issues, he's been vocal. He's been a mouthpiece, whether it comes to issues with police and uh, you know, police violence and stuff, police brutality. I mean, LeBron James has been a guy who's unwilling to to duck anything like that controversial. So kudos to him for that and being a leader uh, for his community. And like we said, thankfully his family's all right, and hopefully they can persevere. It's, it through. seems they have the may have surveillance tape of this, right. so we'll see if the, that, that person yeah. gets found out. Yeah, or not, exactly. So. Hopefully that happens. Mike and Mike is presented by Progressive Insurance. Now you can test drive snaps to see how much you can save before switching to Progressive. Visit progressive.com/slash snapshot. The other major story, of course, this week has been Tiger woods and while i think the fact that alcohol was not involved there's less of a stigma if you get a dui although some would argue prescription pills obviously are still very serious and you cannot be in the state that tiger woods was in when police found him now the video was actually released so this adds more to it mike it's it's a different generation right in the past if a guy got a dui obviously it's horrible but people can move on i think once you can actually see video and pictures and see how terrible tiger yeah. looks it really makes the situation that much yeah more you know we t- and a couple of days ago when this first happened green and i did talk about that when you hear dui you normally think of drinking and then you were like oh it was prescription medicine you're kind of like oh that's a little different mm-hmm. but in, in all honesty i had a, a longer conversation with my wife about it before we went to cleveland and really kind of made me think more about it to say should we treat it as less yeah. you know we all know what, uh, listen, I, I've, I've driven on pain meds, you know, but I never thought about it. I, and then, but maybe it's, maybe it's time we do. We have an opioid issue going on, certainly, of what it can affect you. And you actually read the bottles and read the warnings. And there is about operating vehicles and it's out there. And then if there were four prescription meds in his system, I mean, there a is a, there is a responsibility there to say, you know what, if I'm taking these things, do I need to get behind the wheel of a car? And then when you hear mm-hmm. how disoriented he was, you know, in some of this, you're like, man, I mean, you know, you make a decision to get in a car. So initially, I think that was a lot of people's thought, but I've kind of backed off and, and you know, and, and I've learned on this to say, you know, may, maybe, you know, you, you have to have that responsibility, even if you're taking prescription med, these painkillers, that you better be damn careful about what you're doing when you do that. As I mentioned, now the surveillance video has been released. If you haven't seen it, here it is. Where are you coming from? L.A. From where? L.A. From L.A.? Yeah. Okay. Where are you coming from right now? Um, back down to Orange County. You're headed down to Orange County? Yeah. Okay. Do you know where you're at right now? Uh, I do You have no idea? Okay. You're just driving around or what? Uh, I like to drive. 
I'm sorry? I like to drive. You like to drive? Just go to Mendelus. Okay. Walk to the off course and like that. Okay. Um, have you had anything to drink tonight? I'm not. Are you sure? Yes. 100%? 100%. Okay. Have you taken any illegal drugs? No. Okay. Have you taken any medication? Yes. All right, right now. Okay. I'm placing you under arrest for suspicion of driving under the influence, okay? I mean, more than anything, Mike, it's just a sad video to see. Well, it is. I mean, and, and like we've seen with a lot, once a video gets put to something, you know, it really kind of intensifies what is already it should be considered a bad situation. But then to hear him saying, you know, where you where you go or coming from or L.A. and right. Orange County and he's in he's in Florida, right. you know, saying this and uh, but, you know, and there was damage to the car, two of the wheels blown out and damage to the fender and such. So. I mean, there's no doubt he was obviously disoriented. Now, the question was, was he like that when he got into the car? Did it happen? Well, I have no idea. Yeah. But the, the bottom line is is obviously the effect that these pills have had on him. And, and I'm not jumping to any more of, mm-hmm. oh, you know, you've heard people say this guy needs help. I don't know that. I don't, right. I don't know Tiger enough to, to make that jump to say, man, you know, he's taking these prescription meds and driving. He could be an isolated. Have, have, have no idea. But mm-hmm. I do think the initial thought, that Greeny and I had, I have definitely come off of that to say, you know what? Okay. Oh, who? Thank God it wasn't. It wasn't drinking, and it was right. just prescription drugs. You know what? That needs to be looked at. That needs to be not make that like, oh, it, it's oh, people do that. It's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal, and, and there's a reason right there. You see how disoriented mm-hmm. you could be, and what those meds can do to you, and then especially when you're operating a car. He was arrested wearing a white Nike shirt. The company so far has stood behind him, and. I agree with you. I just think it's a little bit dangerous for people to try to say his life's in a downward spiral to connect us to the infidelities from nine years ago. Yep. I mean, clearly he's had a lot of back pain, and you know it, Mike. Debilitating yes, back yes. pain can be awful. That's all I know is that he's got debilitating pain. He's been trying to battle through it, and unfortunately this was a terrible error in judgment. Hopefully he can persevere and learn from it. The best of Mike and Mike. Great to have you with us here on Mike and Mike, ESPN Radio, ESPN2. Adnan Verkin for Greeny alongside Golik Sr. and Golik Jr. with us for the next 20 minutes. As always, we're presented by Progressive Insurance and all of our phone guests in the Shell Penzo Performance Line. I know, Mike, you're going to be bummed. Normally you're with us on Friday, but you're leaving today. You're going to your college reunion. Leave it five Got years Five out. year. Yeah, wow. buddy. Is five year a little too premature? Like I, I think college for you. Wait, listen. they get to go to college and party. <laughs> well, seriously, I'm not. I'm not going to knock. I get to eat lunch think... back at the dining hall. I'm going straight to that cereal wall. About to do some damage. You know what's going to be bad is when you go like to the bars that you used to go to and be highly disappointed how where you are five years later. No, I'm going to be highly happy that the drinks there cost about a quarter of what they do in the real world. Oh, that's true, <laughs> yeah. too. But what you normally you're on with us on Friday and what you're going to miss, and, I, and I'm saying it out there right now, yeah. so we better be stocked full of them tomorrow. Tomorrow is National Donut Day. So, oh, it is tomorrow. Wow. Listen, that, that's, I shouldn't have to say any more <laughs> about what tomorrow it should be raining donuts here. And you will miss out, my friend. I'm not going to be missing out on a damn thing. Shout out to Martin's in South Bend. I'm going to be coming over there stocking up. (laughs) That that was my my Sunday morning cure for a long time. And Sunday mornings get moved up to Friday. The finals do start tonight. (laughs) Uh, Look forward to that. I look forward to the stories, I should say, especially on Twitter. Uh, Mike Holtz, Jr., of course, first and last is 4 to 6 a.m. Eastern on ESPN, Monday through Friday. The theme of trash talk. Game yes. one NBA Finals tonight, Warriors and Cavaliers. Let's first hear what Richard Jefferson had to say. Then I want to talk to a couple of guys who know a thing or two about trash talk. Jefferson on why it will not help. I don't view that trash talk is going to be um, a key part of this series, uh, especially when you look at it, I think, from the emotional spot. I think our team was the most poised last year. Uh, I think that's why we were able to go and get uh, – go and get uh, – the championship, especially in Game Seven, uh, you know, uh, Steph got got kicked out of the game. Draymond got suspended for one game. So the fact that we want to reference trash talk and getting under people's skin, I, I think you know we have to. Whoever the most poised team uh, is going to win, and I think we were the most poised team last year. So trying to add trash talk to see if it can get underneath our skin, uh, I think both teams just need to be poised. Trash talk to me is an interesting phenomenon that's in all sports. And I think for the most part, I think trash talk is just players. That's how they play. That that's what gets them in their groove. That's what makes them and helps them play the way they want to play. Because 
to think that there's any value in it, that it has an effect, I think is somewhat funny. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't, because if you find somebody that you're able to get under the skin of, then you you bore away. You know, mm-hmm. you get under their skin and you use that to your advantage. But I think the majority of it, you're not getting under the person's skin. And I think, Mike, it's more of a, that's just kind of the way the player is and that what helps him get in the mood he needs to be in for the game. Yeah, some guys need them need it to get them up, and some understand that if you've got a guy, I mean, think of all the battles we've seen between Odell Beckham and Josh Norman where that becomes a part of it, where you've got one guy that recognizes, all right, this guy's so good, if I can do anything to just knock him off a little bit. Thankfully, that was something that in our position, we never had to worry about all that much of someone trying to figure out extra ways yeah. to knock us off our pedestal because it, you're, yeah, trash talk was just never something I needed. And it seems to be a thing that exists a little more the further away from the center of the field oh, you get. But definitely in basketball, you'll have a lot of guys tell you that that's just, a part of, that's just a part of the game. Like that's a part of you growing up and kind of proving yourself in that mentality. You, you, and too. plus you're, you're by each other all the time. You know, in football, you go away and you huddle. Maybe you don't huddle, but you're separated and then you're together for six seconds hitting and talking and then you're separated. I think it's a pers- perfect example. Josh Norman and Odell Beckham. Do we think anything that either one is saying to one another has an effect? Do, do, do we think it's doing anything to either one of them who are talk? I just think that's both their personalities that they just like to talk. It depends because the best t- trash talk usually has some nugget of truth in it. Mm. Like if there's something in there that you know when it hits you, like, damn, that might be true, that exists a lot more for players a step down from that superstar level. Like you right. look at this game with Cle- with Cleveland and the Warriors. Right. Like outside, Kevin Durant – open to trash talk. Draymond Green uniquely open to trash talk after last year. But if you're looking at LeBron and the Cavs right now, I mean, what is the worst thing you can lob at the guys who are the defending champions who came in in a situation they weren't expected to win in last year and managed to beat you and followed it up with the year that they've had? Like, you've got to have that nugget of truth inside the trash talk or else it kind of yeah. rings hollow. That's true. You need to have somebody who's sensitive enough to the trash talk with yeah, rabbit ears and then somebody who is malicious and can get conniving in there. enough to get in there and get you under do. a guy's skin. That's why it works I, both ways. That's why I think it's a low percentage of it that actually works. And, and to Mike's point, and he's right from our sport, and I've always said this, the further away from the ball, the more of the trash talk there was. Because linemen just, listen, my, I'm not going to lie, my trash talk was two words and it ended in you. That, that was all <laughs> I could really get. My brother Greg tried so much to give me lines to use when I was playing. Right. He would actually call me and say, try this line or that line or that guy. And it never worked. It was bleep you. And that was it. And right. I was back in a huddle conserving my air, you know. And, and plus, I was never really in a position to trash talk to somebody, you know. I mean, <laughs> what was I going – what check was I going to write with my trash talking? That hey, you get a big anything? sack and then all of a sudden you get the, back in the big guys. sack, I mean, was a rarity. So, I mean, I was too busy trying to celebrate after a big sack. <laughs> the best line that I ever heard, Zach Streif, who's the right tackle for the New Orleans Saints, said one time, you don't get bonus points for blocking them mad. And I had – Difficult enough time trying to block them just in a normal state. So like you said, I'm not writing some check for any extra than I need to. Always heard it from Mark Schlereth when he played with Shannon Sharp, who was just a unbelievable talker. Right. And Stink would always say, dude, you're writing checks to people that I have to cash. Right. You know, they're going against me and such. So, you know, stop. You know, but 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 some guys, you know, that that's that's their game. They just talk. That's what gets them going as well. That is the difference in football, too, is basketball. You can go out there and talk all this trash. Right. There's not much in the way of retribution for it you talk that trash in football and you quite literally have to hit that guy mm-hmm. on the next play or get hit by a guy in certain what? cases so there's a physical penalty yes. that comes with the trash talk and as you said to your point what are you going to say to the Cavs you know and quite honestly I mean the what are the Cavs going to cut you the, the war Golden State's a great team now they beat them last year coming back 3-1 you can try and rub that in their face a little bit but but Again, I'm just one of those. I, I, unless you really find somebody that it's working on, mm-hmm. I think it's just more that's part of your own routine that you kind of need to do. The worst, Mike, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just say the worst thing that ever happened was someone called all of us in our road whites fat on the O-line. We all came back over to the sideline. We're like, do you hear that guy? Yeah. Because that one, there's a nugget of truth. We're very self-conscious about the way we looked at the road did, did whites. all of you old linemen, which, by the way, are the, by, by far the most neurotic group on the field, did you all kind of look at one? Do I look fat in this? Do I look we fat? Can, we I, got back <laughs> over. like get in your stances and say, do I look fat in my left-handed stance? We got back over on the sideline, and Chris Watt, who played for the San Diego Chargers for a little bit, looks over and goes, do you hear that guy call us fat? <laughs> We gotta run suicides, guys. We gotta. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we gotta talk to coach. Maybe we're blue on the road yeah. too. Like I don't know how we can negotiate this, but this white ain't doing it.
it. Yeah, we're not the hogs here. Mike and Mike brought to you by the free 18 Birdies app. Make your phone the best club in your bag. Last year during the finals, Draymond Green reportedly called LeBron James the B word. LeBron said it was disrespectful. So I don't know. That's the other thing. Okay, it's disrespectful. Why would you let that bother you? Why Why would I? I, right. I, I never cared what anybody called me. You know, you talk, the people talk about families. I never had that. I, right. People swore at me all the time, called me. I, what do I care? Right. Well, I, call, me, call me the B word. So what? I mean, it's in the heat of the moment. Do, do we really think that Draymond Green thinks LeBron James, the best player in the world, is that? Right. I mean, of course even so. if he does, so what? I mean, I, I never understood. How are you going to let that affect you if you call me the B word? Ooh, it, wow. Is there a line, though, Mike, if somebody said to you religion or race or sexual orientation? No, or do you say, no, no and the athlete, no. I use whatever I can Here's to win. The thing. Why? Because I was cognizant of the fact that I would not let it affect me. Yeah. I would not give them the. It's kind of like when, when that, that fan yells and that fan yells, the worst thing in the world you do is acknowledge them. Don't, don't give them the acknowledgement that you have heard what they said, and are reacting to it. Right. So the same way with a player. I would laugh everything off. Right. You know, because you know, I, I got called everything in the world for, you know, sure. bench war, horrible, did any sworn at. Yeah. But you just laugh it off. You don't let them see that it would affect you in any way. And then after the game, I'd sit in my locker and I'd cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it, it's, it's knowing the source, though. Like, you were unaffected by that. I had teammates that were very affected by that. Like, I had a teammate of mine who had – uh, you know, a homophobic slur lobbed at him from the sideline at a game, and we had to stop him from throwing a Gatorade cooler into the stands. Right. Like, so there are guys that are uniquely susceptible to that. So to that point about LeBron, like, if that's something that he brought up, you've just chummed the waters oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, you, you don't like that stuff? Great. Yeah, I got yeah, more. Well, that's going. Going. Exactly. Yeah, I got some down. new. I've been working on new materials <laughs> yeah. since last finals, LeBron. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got exactly. some for you. We finally got one that hit. <laughs> uh, Adnan Verkin for Grady alongside Golick and Mike Golick Jr. Let's do a little next question brought to you by Indeed.com. Post your next job opening on the world's number one job site. Over, under, six and a half points. The Warriors will beat the Cavs by tonight. Oh, boy. Over. I, I think I am going to go. I, I think Golden State's going to take care of business in game one. I think Cleveland will get a split, but I think it'll be the second game they're going to win. I do think Golden State wins tonight. I would. This, for me, hinges the over-under because I would take the under unless Steve Kerr is on the bench tonight. Right, I think could there, happen. I think there's an uptick you get from that, and just knowing that when you see a coach or someone like that go through a hardship – you're always going to play hard because it's the finals, but I think there's just there's something a little bit extra about having your guy back and really wanting to make sure you welcome him back the right way on your home court. I'm going to take the under, though. All right, right now, that is the official line, according to Westgate, 6.5. So, Senior and I both taking the over, Junior taking the under. Next question, the first year we won't have Cavs, Warriors, in the finals will be? Hembo, you can help me with this, but I, I think the core can be together at least another couple of years from, from, a, from a, I'm almost positive of that, from the contract standpoint we also heard kevin durant said he may take less to help even some of the ancillary players stay there i'm going to say two more years of this this year wow. two more years so it'll be five i'm i'm, I'm going to go out crazy and say five just i think lebron at least has two more years of lebron play in him mm -hmm. and you know Kyrie is, is 25 years friggin' old i mean come on you know kevin love is getting his groove and they get the the, the other pieces as well I think they got two more years of it after this. I'll say one just because you can't account for injury and a number of things that happen along the way and development. We've seen San Antonio, how cl close it looked, albeit for a brief moment right. before True. Kawhi went down. You hear the talks about Chris Paul potentially joining there. And then you look at Giannis and some of the young stars coming out of the Eastern Conference that are going to be growing into the prime of their career. And at some point, you have to think LeBron James slows down a kick. Yeah, the buck stops here. I think this is the final year. I think next year, either the Spurs and Kawhi, maybe the Raptors next year, we yeah. the North. I mean, there can always be a team that can put up them up. Yeah, we got a shot. <laughs> Not having any MLB players in ESPN's top 100 most famous athletes in the world means. Does it mean that baseball, we keep talking about it, what a regional sport it is? Is, is that what it more than anything else is? And. In baseball, are the stars, because they don't wear helmets, I mean, their faces aren't covered. You can see them, you know, like you do soccer players, which of this 138 are soccer players. Mm -hmm. 
Is it that the stars of this league need to be out there even more? Bryce Harper is getting more and more, but but Mike Trout could be the most unassuming superstar out there. Most vanilla you guy, know, plays in the market. It, it gets Los Angeles, but it's not yeah, the Dodgers. Yeah, it's exactly. not baseball so, heavy. You know, it, it, I just I just don't think they're out there enough. Yeah, I think it means the, the Major League Baseball is slacking a bit here, not getting your superstars out there, but it's tough because they're not polarizing right. in the way they used to be. I look at when baseball was most interesting to me, and it was that 90s long ball era right. of baseball. Baseball, when you had guys that certainly were embroiled in some controversy, but whether you loved or hated them, you were watching right. the McGuire, you know, Sosa home runways. You were watching Barry Bonds chase history, mm-hmm. regardless of the fact that if you hate, you were hate watching them along the way. It was interesting. You had characters. I mean, Albert Pujols is about to blast his 600th exactly home run, right, and right. no one cares, yeah. and no one's talking about it. I mean, this and is that's a, an issue. You're exactly right because this is a time where we'd be networks would be breaking into his at bats, right, showing it until he got to that six. And it just doesn't mean that much anymore. Yeah, it could be the ninth guy ever to have 600 home yeah. runs and have the second highest batting average at the time of doing so. One of the great right handed hitters of all time, which you're right. Right now, it's a non issue. What do you think Hugh Jackson really meant when he said Brock Osweiler has been a pleasant surprise? Listen, I don't take any bits of for 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 guys of the you know there's there's what 90 guys on the roster right now but there's there's guys who were starting quarterbacks in the stars of the team i don't take words of coaches for anything <laughs> when you're practicing in shorts in a jersey okay i don't so, so i thought you were gonna say you don't take anything from coaches ever I, I, but no, definitely no, now. no i don't what, 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 what let me tell you what if you look bad now you got a real issue you're right you know i equate this to like your pro day <laughs> you know for a quarterback <laughs> right when he's throwing to his own guys on air no know, excuses that's exactly what they're doing in otas i mean right. so I, I, I don't take a whole lot from it, quite honestly, Mike, because you better look good at this point, quite honestly. It is. I'd say it's what you would expect, and it could be speaking more to you are spending time day-to-day with Brock Osweiler for the first time, and this is a guy who was handed the keys and given a big contract and has been humbled in a huge way that could come into this with any number of attitude issues off of that, and maybe that's the venue in which he's surprised Hugh Jackson here. It's setting an awfully low bar, but it's where we're probably at with Each Brock. one of you, I've already said it, I'll say it again, uh, opening day, who's the starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns? I think Osweiler gets the nod, but I don't think he's going to last. Cody Kessler. I'm sorry, I said Cody Kessler as well. Yeah. It's it's crazy to think. Osweiler, like I said, that big contract, the expectations, yeah. and now you can't even start for the but Browns. But then again, the only expectations were in Houston because everybody, we all crushed that move. Like, right. what, what are you doing? <laughs> Give a ton of money. The dead animal you'd prefer to carry into an NHL arena. This is, of course, going back to the, the catfish story, the guy who smuggled the catfish. Well, catfish and again, botched kudos country. to the guy who smuggled in the catfish, uh, the Nashville fan. He did drive over his t- He got a catfish. Car. He gutted it, took all the guts out, spine and everything, ran it over with his car to flatten it out, rolled it up, put it in cellophane, Stuck it into his underwear and put a pair of compression shorts. Sprayed it down with Old Spice first, too, just to mitigate some of the smell. Sure, and then put it in his underwear and put compression shorts over the top of that. I mean, (laughs) that's doing work to get that catfish in there. I don't know how we're going to say kudos to like We're along that timeline because that's a lot of steps. That's almost more steps than I'm willing to do for anything. Putting yeah. together a piece of furniture, right. preparing a gift for somebody. Somewhere along that line, maybe when you're backing up the car over this dead <laughs> fish, do you realize maybe this isn't quite worth it to just go and get arrested? There's part of me that says kudos for going through all of it and taking it all the way to the start. Because to fan is short for fanatic, and you can exactly tell this guy's right. a loyal predator. Exactly. Yeah, you can make better use of a dead cat. Catfish, do it like the uh, do it like the Titans O line did. You dump half your beer into the catfish, you chug half the beer, and then maybe when the cameras are off you, you drink the beer out of the catfish. Yeah. Okay. So which would you carry on to the? What would you throw onto the ice? Maybe would, what was in your garage? I, yeah, I would prefer not to. I, I, I too, I'm too close to the subject right now. I came home the other day and just sitting in my garage, this possum just decided to walk its way in there and die. Uh, but it was very, it was like weird because I had a lot of people saying, "Look, oh maybe it's playing, playing possum." Playing exactly. possum. Exactly. First so I, I, thought of. I opened yeah, up right. the garage and I gave him about an hour. I said, "Listen, champ, like if this is you trying to get one over on me, you got to wake up pretty early in the morning." <laughs> turns out that he had gone to for the long sleep good night. He uh, did, but he went into that garage to die. And, was, and I wouldn't. I had no. <laughs> He chose to be his final yeah, resting place. I'm going to go into this garage and die. <laughs> and nowhere along that course of time did I think, you know what? Time to fillet it, run yeah, it over, yeah. and sneak it into a stadium of McCrouch. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not going to happen. Have to yeah. declaw it first. Yeah, no, there's a whole different process <laughs> yeah, there. the whole thing there. Taxidermy. Yeah. The, the, the crotch controversy. By the way, the national mayor did say he's not going to get charged. So he was arrested, but they said, we're, we're going to 
Get rid of the charges on that. The movie you've never turned off, Mike Senior, if it's on TV, is? Well, I, anytime it's on and I get mocked Wedding all crashes. the time. <clears throat> no, no oh. but I have more than a few. Sure. But if yeah. I'm going to name the one, it's probably the older one of my Armageddon. Really? Yeah. Okay. Michael Bay, big explosions. Ar- yeah, yeah. Don't want to close your eyes. Don't want to miss a thing. I still always cry at the end. Danny, I love you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or Harry, I love you. Danny. Danny. <laughs> Harry, I love you. I love you. Uh, I love that movie. Yeah. Oh, it's great. It's a great movie. Uh, oceans in certain number here. Any of the Oceans movies. Really? The third one I was so Any, uh, yeah. any yeah. of the Oceans I do, movies. Listen, I, I, they are in it too. I like yeah. that. And, and you said Wedding Crashers. That as well. Hangover as well. Comedies are always in there. That's why for me it's The Naked Gun. Anytime Frank Drebin is involved with any sort of mishap. Airplane's another one I can never yeah. The up. toughest part about the movies like Hangover and, and some of those others is yeah. when they're on regular TV, they're just too... The, the censorship issue, censorship yeah. Censorship yeah. 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 I did, to I watch did find that with the original yeah. Hangover. But Oceans, yeah. I'm with you on the Oceans. They, oh, they listen, are really that's good. A, it's a golden era of Brad Pitt, the, the oversized cuff uh, <laughs> Brad Pitt in that yeah, movie is, is iconic. Very good. But I can't get enough of Harry Stamper, so... yeah. yeah. Uh, once again, that was next question brought to you by Indeed.com. Post your next job opening on the world's number one job site. Before we let Mike Jr. go, because he does have uh, not only a spelling bee, which is going to be on ESPN3, but also he's going to get back to South Bend. Did want to get your thoughts on the baseball brawl. Uh, suspension reduced for Bryce Harper from four to three. I like the fact that Hunter Strickland was the aggressor and got more than Harper, although if you want to look at by actual service, he's the reliever, so he should have got like 10 games, and Harper should only got two games. But how do you see it? Yeah, these things don't necessarily equal equal out in the penalty you're causing a team because you're still missing your day-to-day best player for three games if you're the Nationals. I'm just sort of confused about what baseball should do here because we talked about the lack of star power and interest. One thing people love is conflict, whether it's us disagreeing here on the radio, Mm -hmm. teams not liking each other the way that people think that guys are too chummy. That baseball fight was blowing up SportsCenter the other day. Nonstop news there, and so... Do you allow that to happen? Because based on your penalties, you're not curtailing this. The, the nope. easy way to stop it is to crazy lighten someone's wallet the way you can do in the pro sports mm-hmm. and make that suspension really hurt them in that time period. But Major League Baseball hasn't shown any willingness to do that. So what are what are we supposed to be left to think? What, what is one of the other big things we, we talked about for days on all of our shows was the Orioles and the Red Sox. When the Machado and Dustin Pedroia at second base, and then all of a sudden they keep throwing at Machado and they keep missing him. Well, it was off. All, but all that I went must on. Must watch TV. But, but it was but... everywhere, to, right. to Mike's point. So I, I, I agree. I don't think baseball wants to get rid of this at all. They'll, they'll right. stay to their suspensions, and then they'll move on and say this is baseball. And it's unfortunate because it's not baseball. Like, this isn't actually baseball, and you've got this whole idea of self-policing. And now... You know, give the the other baseball players credit. We've heard them say, you know, this isn't what we do. This when we mean self policing, right, right, and right. everyone has pointed to this and said, no, this is wrong. Right. But you at least leave it open for things like this to keep happening. What is interesting though is that sometimes former players will just say, well, you didn't play the game, you don't understand it. But even the guys like Aaron Boone, Eddie Perez, the guys that work on the baseball yeah, plant, were yeah. saying they disagree with what Strickland. Well, did. they this said this thing. one was was ridiculous. Like two and, and, and a half. I would later. I would agree as well. Two and a half years, seriously. Right. And this is what, how about striking him out. Right. You know, strike him out and give him the death stare if you want. That, that to me, is a nice way of, of getting back at a guy who just, you know, went yard on you twice instead of hitting him in the hip. And the Buster Posey pausing to wait. I mean, the, now there's speculation. Maybe Strickland told him, hey, listen, I'm going to get Harper. Or, we, uh, we've also heard that he's told not to get in fights because he had the concussions. Who right. knows? I, Remember the Titan style. Let him through. Yeah. Let him, <laughs> let let him, him through. through. That's <laughs> Uh, next time, Mike Coach Jr. will tell us how he would trash talk his father, if need be, on an athletic competition. That's the tease for the next time you're here. That's a good ugly. tease right there. <laughs> hey, I'm Chad Millman on the latest Behind the Bets podcast. Bob Scucci, bookmaker, joins me from Vegas, plus Aaron Rinning, professional sports better. Both of them break down the NBA Finals. Let's get the thoughts of our friend Scotty Pippen. Pippen ain't easy. The Basketball Hall of Famer right now joining us on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Scotty, thanks so much for coming on, Mike and Mike. First and foremost, um, I know you want to discuss this whole Steph Curry issue and the fact that some have said he has a lot to prove after last year's Game 7. What do you think Steph has to prove starting tonight? Well, I don't think he has anything to prove. I think, you know, my question was kind of taken out of context, and the question was whether or not Steph had any pressure on him in these finals to be an MVP. And my point was, at this point, I don't think he has any pressure. I thought he played great in his first finals, even though he wasn't the MVP. He could have obviously been the MVP. Uh, the fact that Cleveland had to 
put so much focus on him in terms of stopping him offensively um, allowed Andre Iguodala to get a lot of open opportunities and a lot more opportunities to score the basketball. But I don't think he has to do anything. He has to be a very smart point guard. He has to make the right decisions with the basketball. He has to limit his turnovers and continue to play the type of basketball that we've been watching throughout these the playoffs. And um, I, I just think that, you know, he will be able to do that. He's a very smart basketball player. He's a great shooter. Uh, I, I think he will be able to pick his moments throughout these playoffs and be very effective, as we've seen in the past. You know, not many people can, can answer this question. Where you're going to, to three straight finals, this happens to be the same team. Now, you've obviously done the three straight finals, but it wasn't not playing the same team in the finals. But still, to get to that finals, as you do it year after year, does it change kind of the meaning of the regular season to you? Is it more of, well, let's get through this because we know where we're going to end up in the playoffs and making another run at the championship? Does it do anything to the regular season? I think it does a lot to the regular season. I mean, I think once you see a team continuously go through the playoffs, as we've seen with the San Antonio Spurs, uh, you know, the coaches uh, tend to find some kind of way to rest those players. Uh, is the regular season important to you? Sure it is. Uh, it's important that you get home for the advantage, but sometimes those situations just uh, present different challenges for its injuries and trying to implement new players in so you can get better as a team. So you, you, you take some losses uh, here and there. So at the end of the day, uh, winning a home court advantage isn't the number one priority. I think the number one priority is that you're healthy as a team and that you're playing some of your best basketball. Um, we didn't see Cleveland play some of their best basketball going into the playoff, but we always knew that they had another gear. So in, in saying that, um, Yes, it is important, but for a team like Cleveland, who pretty much has has established themselves as the best team in the East, uh, I don't think it is important for them to have home court advantage and to overexert themselves in the regular season to try to make sure that they're the number one team in basketball, and I mean by having a better record than the Golden State Warriors. Scotty Pippen joining us in the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line, taking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole new level. Make the switch to Pennzoil Synthetics today. LeBron's making his seventh straight finals appearance, something even your Bulls were not able to accomplish, Scotty. Is that more a testament to LeBron's play or a commentary in the lack of consistent depth in the Eastern Conference? Well, I, I, I think that's more a testament to LeBron James. Um, you know, we, we've seen this guy when he carried the team to the finals when he was a lot younger. Um, the fact that, you know, he carried that team to the finals without any Hall of Fame players or any great players, so to speak, or all-stars. Uh, maybe Augustus was an all-star, but really his performance that he started early on has continued to go off uh, a year in and year out. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a credit to him, just his, his longevity, um, the fact that, you know, this this kid plays through injuries and things of that nature and never really complains and just his durability. Um, you know, you, you just have to take the hat off to him because he's there every single year. Talking to basketball Hall of Famer Scotty Pippen here on Mike and Mike on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. So I asked people like, like – athletes who have records if they want to see their record broken. And I'm one of those that I'd be like, man, I don't want to see my record broken. If it's broken, I'm, I'm more than willing to shake the person's hand, but that doesn't mean I'm rooting for it. I love the fact every year the, the players from the 1972 Miami Dolphins, mm -hmm. when there's no more undefeated teams, they pop champagne. I think that's great. So when there's talk in basketball of the best one-year team of all time and your guys' 95-96 team is in that conversation for it. There are some that say if the Golden State Warriors win the champion this year, the championship, that they may be considered the greatest team of all time. Is there part of you that wants to see them lose because of that? And I don't. Think, I think that's just fine, but I mean, I, I just wonder from someone in your position, would you like to not have this team to compete with when people talk about the greatest teams ever? You know what? I... I looked back a year ago, and if you asked me that question, I would have said, yes, I want to see them lose. And I did watch them lose um, in that finals against uh, Cleveland. Uh, this year, I don't think it really played a role in terms of them being marked as the greatest team ever because 
they made some subtle changes. I guess I can say some major changes. They went out and got one of the best scores, if not the leading score in the NBA in, in Kevin Durant last season. So um, that's changed to me the whole dynamic of their team. Uh, you went out and got an uh, MVP who has really enhanced your team to another level. And that's not the same team that we saw last season. Uh, they didn't have the same regular season record. So you can't give them that greatness cap that they were able to accomplish last year. But they wasn't able to win a championship, which really, uh, you know, it takes away from that, that great season to me. Talking right now with Scotty Pippen on Mike and Mike, ESPN Radio and ESPN2. The debate, the best all time, LeBron versus Mike, we know it's going to rage forever. But in your mind, what would LeBron need to accomplish the rest of his career, Scotty, to legitimately be in that conversation? Well, I, I think he's already in that conversation. Uh, we can't pick one player. Uh, both players are great in, in their time. Um, it's it's hard to take anything away from the accomplishment that Michael was able to achieve as a player, uh, what he meant to the game, his impact still in today's game. Um, we have to give LeBron that same first shape. Uh, obviously, he's been great for the game. He's been a guy that had longevity. He's been in the playoffs every year. His impact from a statistical standpoint or just mind-shattering, uh, we have to give him time to – you know, have some time away from the game so we can really appreciate what we've been able to watch over the last 14 years from LeBron James. Uh, to me, they're both great players. Uh, I give LeBron a lot of credit because I've had the opportunity to watch LeBron James, whereas my career sort of evolved with Michael. I played with him, and now that I'm a fan of the game and I'm able to watch every game, uh, it's truly amazing what I've been able to see LeBron James do. All right, Scotty, let's go back to when we were kids on the schoolyard and we were picking teams, okay? And I'm changing the rules a little bit. You get to pick all five. So both starting lineups for these two teams are standing on the schoolyard, 10 guys, and you have to pick the starting five out of that. Which five are you picking? Out of both of these teams, 10 both, guys? Both of these, ten, the both teams starting lineups. Which five do you pick wow. to start for your team? Uh, I, I'm obviously going to pick the three MVPs, uh, KD, LeBron James, Steph Curry. Um, wow, that's a tough one. I'll probably have to go with Draymond Green. I like his toughness. Uh, and I'll go ahead with Clay Thompson. I mean, uh, I think I've got a lot of utility guys. I think guys that I have can do multiple things, LeBron and Draymond, um, I trust them on the boards against anybody, any size. Uh, they play above and beyond, so that would be my five. The best of Mike and Mike. Alongside Golik, I'm Adnan Burke in for Greeny. We're Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. As always, we are presented by Progressive Insurance. All of our phone guests in the Shell Penzo Performance Line. At last, we're going to have the NBA Finals tonight. we got some good NBA action, we hope, with Game 1. Of course, we're going to be recapping Stanley Cup Final. Mm-hmm. So far, 2-0 Pittsburgh leads it. Rick DiPietro is going to join us about 10 minutes from now. But some good tweets here because earlier, Mike, we were discussing what's that movie that you stop yeah. immediately if your channel starts. And this all started with uh, mine and my son Mike's review of Baywatch, uh, which did horrible at the box office. I gave it 2 out of 5 stars, but, but I would still recommend going to two see it. 2 out of 5 donuts. Two Two out of five donuts. I'm sorry. Two out of five donuts. But I would still recommend seeing it. I mean, it is just, it is. just know what it is going in. It's, it's good-looking girls. It's good-looking guys. There's a you know a, a plot to it, obviously. Hmm. And it has some humor in it. I, I my expect. Let me put it this way. Yeah. My expectations were met okay. in it. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, some people went a little far. I, I said my favorite comedy of all time is The Hangover. Great one. I, I mean, Abby, watchability. Abby tweets to me. Two stars for Baywatch. I thought it had great humor, plot, and action. Great. That's fine. It's everybody's opinion. How can the hangover be Golick's favorite and this get two donuts? Abby, I mean, you're certainly entitled to your opinion. But if you're comparing Baywatch and the hangover, then I, I don't know what to tell you. All it's of that. it's a different just, sport. It's, it's a different league. I disagree with that. I mean, I, yeah. I, would, I would recommend going to watch Baywatch and just know what you're going to. Hangover, 
I, I just just absolutely loved. Epic. The only the only disappointment with the hangover is that two was so bad oh, for yeah. the first oh, one. The third, but but you had it. to do it. Exactly. Yeah, you had to because you knew so it was good. still going to make some money. Well, it was just so fresh at that time because nobody knew those. Nobody that, right? Knew. Bradley exactly. Cooper and Galifianakis. It, well, that, like, see, that's the biggest difference. Right. In Baywatch, I knew what to expect. I right. knew that the le- expectation was somewhat low. Right. But I was still fine with it. I still enjoy. I walked out of there. I laughed at parts. I enjoyed the movie. Yeah. Hangover, you had zero clue what to expect. Mm -hmm. None of the names were big names. Bradley Cooper was not a big name at that point. So you had no idea. So it it obviously exceeded anybody's expectations. They find a baby. Mike Tyson's involved. The trailers were great. incredible. Then we get to, though, that led to when you're watching TV and you – Go buy a movie. What do you never pass? What do you always stop at? Michael says Departed. I love the Departed. Scorsese there, movie more, won an Oscar. That, and I love it for the fact that ha- that has to be the movie with the most headshots known to mankind. Yeah. Everybody gets shot in the head. <laughs> Everybody gets shot in the head. But, but you're right. DiCaprio, Damon, Nicholson, the amount of violence in that movie. Yeah. But the only issue with the Departed, like you said, on cable, it's just so heavily yep. censored. And all right. of a sudden you go, I don't, I'd rather watch the original. Kevin's saying it has to be Blues Brothers with Caddyshack a close second. Like those. Absolutely. Uh, Carrie's saying go to Behind Enemy Lines. Anything with Denzel. I'm a big Denzel fan. I'm a huge Denzel fan. Except for Fallen. And, uh, Mike, I can't pass the quiet man of the outlaw. Josie I'll Wales, Josie classic Wales. Western oh, there, yeah. I mean, I'm a big Western guy. Shout like out Clint that. Eastwood, by the way, turned 87 years old today. Love, Talk about American love Clint Without question. Just love him. Amazing resume yep. he's put together. As always, you can tweet us at Mike and Mike on the winnerherflowers.com Twitter feed, ESPN Golic, Adnan, ESPN, or Mike and Mike. Off the top. The top. All right, before we get to Rick DiPietro and talk and some Stanley Cup final talk, how about the NBA Finals tonight? Warriors host the Cavs, Game 1, 9 Eastern on ABC. Coverage begins 8 o'clock on ESPN Radio. Might be the most anticipated NBA Finals in history, Mike. First time in the four major pro sports that teams meet the championship after splitting the finals the previous two years. The teams entering the series, a combined 24-1 this postseason. The fewest combined losses entering the finals under the current playoff format. Seven All-Stars between the two teams, four for Golden State, three for Cleveland. Last time that happened was the 83 Finals. You have the Warriors' best-scoring margin in this postseason. You have the Cavs' most efficient offense this offseason and probably going to be decided by defense when we talk about who's going to defend who in this. And also the streaks here on both sides. The you know Listen, Golden State is 12-0, and so they're in a 12-game winning streak mm-hmm. considering they lost the last game last year to the Cavs. And the Cavaliers are on a nine-game road postseason winning streak. Game one tonight in Golden State. So one of those streaks has got to end. Off the top. The top. When he steps on the court, LeBron James will be the seventh player in NBA history, only non-Celtic to play in seven straight NBA Finals. James's teams have lost game one of the finals in each of the last five years, but don't fret if that happens tonight. They have rebound to win three of those series tonight. So seven in a row he's played. This would be his... his Eighth finals overall, because he played the one, obviously, uh, early in Cleveland when they got hammered by San Antonio. He has 1,079 finals points. He's seventh, 64 behind uh, Bill or or Sam Jones, I should say. If the game, if the series goes six or seven games and, say, averages, you know, 30 points in that area, he's going to jump from seven all the way to number three. He'll pass Michael Jordan. The top is Jerry West, then Kareem, and then Michael Jordan. Uh, uh, looks like LeBron, if this series, as I said, goes that far, he'll end up third. He would need this finals and probably two more to pass Jerry West to be the all-time scoring leader in the finals. He's already the all-time scoring leader in the postseason, mm-hmm. but to be the all-time leader in, in final scoring, they would have to pass Jerry West, and he's 600 points behind him right now. His numbers have been incredible this postseason. 32.5 points per game he's averaging. He's shooting 56.6% yep. from the field. It's been awesome to watch. Off the top. The it also top. would be awesome if Steve Kerr can make it back. According to our own Ramona Shelburne, Kerr, who has been battling the after effects of back surgery he underwent nearly two years ago, has not been on the sidelines for Golden State since Game 2 of their first-round series against Portland, but he could be back to coach the Warriors in Game 1 tonight. He has not been well enough to be on the sidelines, but we have seen him taking part in practices. He's traveled with the team. He has delivered halftime messages, as Mike Brown has been the Warriors' acting coach. This would be great to see. It is. And he's building up toward it. It's not like he's never been around and then all of a sudden he's on the bench. As, as Adnan said, been flying to the games, been at practices, been given halftime talks as well. So 
he was someone, obviously, his health is the most important thing. But I also think, and then he wanted to make sure he was ready to come back and stay there mm-hmm. and not come back for a game or two, you know, maybe rush it and then have to be out of the, off the sidelines again and be a disruption for that team. I don't think he wanted any part of that. So I think if and when he comes back, if he's able to, I think, and let's hope that he can mm-hmm. be there for the duration. Off the top. The top. In hockey, the Penguins beat the Preds 4-1 and take a commanding 2-0 series lead in the Stanley Cup final. Rick DiPietro is going to join us momentarily. The former NHL goalie to give us his thoughts on it, but rookie Jake Gensel. He led the way again with two goals, including the game winner, second straight game in the series. Gensel, the first player since the great Mario Lemieux in 1992 to score the game-winning goal in each of the first two games of a Stanley Cup final series. He, uh, he has 12 goals this postseason for a rookie that's second all-time in 1981. Dino Cicerelli had 14, so we'll see where this ends up. 22-year-old third-round pick a couple of years ago, a few years ago, I think in 2013, of Pittsburgh. But what a game last night. More penalties or just the same or more penalties in the first period than in the entire game one. It was certainly chippy. Mm-hmm. 1-1 in the first, no scoring in the second, and then boom, boom, boom. I mean, the first three and a half minutes, I believe, of the third period, three goals by Pittsburgh, and it is game over. So they hold court in their hometown, and now, we, which is used to having Stanley Cup games there, to Nashville, which is not used to it. So it is going to be crazy there. So we'll see if they can get back in the series. Off the top. The top. And baseball news, Bryce Harper's suspension reduced from four games to three. He started serving a suspension as the Nationals faced the Giants last night. He's eligible to turn on Sunday against the A's. Hunter Strickland's suspension of six games remains unchanged at this point. Strickland was the instigator in all this because he hit Harper in the hip with a pitch in the eighth and Harper charged the mound. This was dating back to two and a half years ago when Harper took Strickland deep and he hadn't faced him since then. And, and I was happy to hear former baseball players say that, no, this, while there are unwritten baseball rules, this one crosses the line. Two and a half years, you got taken yard twice and this is how you're going to retaliate two and a half years later, you know, pop a guy in the hip. Yeah. I think it was ridiculous as well. So we all thought, that Bryce Harper may get his suspension reduced. They may have felt bad for him with such a bad helmet throw, possibly, that they took a game <laughs> off. Uh, but but I, didn't, I didn't think and don't think Strickland's will get re- reduced at all. I don't think so either. Like you said, public opinion death on the side of Bryce Harper, at least in this one. Mike and Mike is presented by Progressive Insurance. Customers who switch to Progressive save an average of $500. Call or click today. Find out if we could save you hundreds on your car insurance. Before we get to Rick DiPietro, Adnan Verkin for Greeny, alongside Golaker Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio. And ESPN2, Mr. Met flipped off a fan. This is how bad it's gone now for the New York Mets. As Mr. Met, their mascot, was frustrated after somebody said something to him, and so he flipped off a fan. He's now lost his job. The question now becomes, though, Mike, can you really flip somebody off if you don't have as many fingers as the rest of us? Mr. Met, three fingers and one thumb. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you're not really popping the middle finger at anybody. You don't have one, right? I mean, so, I mean, you, you see the tape of it, and they blur it out. I don't know why you're blurring it out, because we always say he gave him the middle finger. There's no middle right. finger with four. Right. Or unless, you know, with three fingers and a thumb. That was the debate this morning between my son Mike and Will Reeve, who was in right. with him, was, is the thumb, do you say you have five fingers, or you have four fingers and a thumb? You know, the, the, the debate there. Right. But bottom line is, how do you flip somebody off with four fingers? <laughs> I mean, I, I hear you. That's definitely it could could uh, go. Let's let's take that one to court. Let, let's right. get somebody on that one to defend, you know, Mr. Met there, mm-hmm. you know, and and decide which way we want to go there. Is yeah, it the, an actual flip off? Well, the Mets, I mean, we apologize for the inappropriate action of the employee. We do not condone this type of behavior. We are dealing with this matter internally. I guess if you see the video, he's clearly not in a celebratory mood. But you're right, Mike. There's there's nuance with this conversation. There is. With there Mr. is. Met. Would he be proven guilty in a court of law? No, I don't think so. That would be interesting. Any chance Matt Harvey dressed up as Mr. Oh, Medford? No, this Hembo oh, was chiming the in there night. from the back seats. Harvey All right. Pitching. Speaking of New York, let's bring in Rick DiPietro, <laughs> the former NHL goalie, co host of Han Humpty and Canty on 98.7 ESPN in New York, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Rick, thanks so much for coming on. Before we talk hockey, what do you think, Mr. Met? Is that possible you can flip somebody off with three fingers? I'm not sure. I think where he gets in trouble is the left hand. He doesn't just go with the one hand. He actually takes the left hand and pulls the one finger down. So I'm not sure which is the middle finger, but um, I'm hearing that JPP is available in case you're looking for another Mr. Matt. Well, see, there you go. And I think you bring up a good point. Now we get to intent. So if he's actually <laughs> taking the time to fold the other fingers down, then I right. think we are looking at intent. So that, that, that does change it now for good me. To, good to know Jason Pierre-Paul <laughs> is on the market, according to Rick. <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> Penguins is up 2 nothing, And I said earlier, Rick, I think the Predators should be up in this series. For, for vast stretches so far, they're still like a final. They've dominated play. They don't have any wins thus far. Pittsburgh comes out in that third period and takes control. But how do you feel if you're Nashville? You've dominated except for the most important position, your former position, that's goalie. Well, I listened to you guys on the way in, Adam, and you're completely right. If if this Nashville team is going to compete in this series, they're going to need Pekka Rinne to play like he has earlier on in this playoffs. I mean, we were throwing his name around for a Conn Smythe trophy, and the one thing I think that people aren't really talking about is the fact that in Pekka Rinne's career as a starting goalie against the Pittsburgh Penguins, he hasn't beaten them yet. I mean, he's played them nine times. He's 0-7-2, and, and in those nine games, he has six of those games where he's letting four or more goals. So I'm not sure if it's the matchup or whatever it is, but... This Pittsburgh Penguins team is, in my opinion, the best in the NHL at turning, you know, a neutral zone turnover, a defensive zone turnover into a goal and not just a scoring opportunity. I mean, you see the goal right there um, off the pad. That's something you practice, you practice in uh, every single day in practices. Coach is saying you're off the angle. Make sure you put it on the goalie's pad. He'll lay out a rebound in front of the net. And it just so happens that this team is good enough where they actually did it. I mean, there's something going on with Pekka Rinne now that, I think he's going to have to get over. Luckily for him, he's going home where, you know, he's 11-1 and in his last 12. So I think there's still hope for this Nashville team. I think they're good enough. But, you know, if Matt Murray's going to play the way he's playing and you're going to get the kind of production you're getting right now from Jake the Snake, Gensel, and Evgeny Malkin, it's going to be a tough task for this Nashville team to get back in the series. Again, Gensel on fire, the 22-year-old rookie who looks 15. You know, one of the, all these guys <laughs> had these big bushy beards, not him. I don't know if he can grow it yet, quite honestly. Well, let, let's, you know, we see the physical part of the game, Rick. Let's go to the men. You were a goalie. You, you, you were between the pipes like uh, uh, Rene is. So is it mental now? You just, you just gave the stats about his, his uh, against Pittsburgh. How much is in his head right now? Well, you know what was amazing, Mike, too, was after the game, he said, I'm looking at this like it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I think as the playoffs have progressed, he's kind of he's played that way. I, I mean, he's been shaking. He's letting some shaky goals, especially off the angles. I mean, when you look at the size, I'm only six feet tall. When I look at Pekka Rene, he's 6'5". So, I mean, any goalie will tell you, and this is one of the one, you know, great things that my goalie coach for me at the end of my career, Steve Valiquet, did. He could see I was struggling with confidence, and he took an iPad with the video, and he put it behind the puck off the angle. And he said, get down in the butterfly and see what the puck sees from this angle. And I'm only six feet. There was absolutely zero net to shoot at. And the goal you're showing right there, that's, that's a cardinal sin for any goalie is to get beat, you know, beat between your body, especially on the post right, th- right, right there. And, um, again, he set the bar so high that that rebound right there was one that he'd probably want back as well. So uh, he's going home. He plays much better at home. Um, he's played too well throughout this entire playoffs not to think that he's going to snap out of it. But if Matt Murray, like I said, is going to play as well as he's played, um, you know, Nashville missing their number one center and not really having the same kind of firepower or depth that Pittsburgh has offensively, it's going to be tough to get back in the series for them. We're talking with Rick DiPietro right now, the former Islanders goalie on Mike and Mike ESPN Radio and ESPN2. Adnan Burke in for Greeny today. P.K. Subban, Rick, I saw the comment. Apparently, if you see it in print, it feels like a guarantee. He says, we're going back home, we're going to win the next game, and then we'll go from there. But if you actually saw him visually say it, he wasn't guaranteeing it. He was just kind of predicting that Nashville will win. On the larger scale, Subban is now getting a lot more attention in America. Jeremy Schaap's terrific piece on E60. Those of us in Canada obviously knew his work with Montreal prior to that. But what do you think of Subban's play so far? Because as a goalie, I've heard some say he's a defensive liability. As much fun as he is offensively, he can be tough in his back end. What do you think? No, I think he's much improved defensively. And as far as, you know, the piece you were just talking about with Jeremy Schaap, I mean, now I'm officially a P.K. Subban fan. I mean, he's well-spoken. I don't think the NHL is doing themselves any favor not having him out, you know, in front of a microphone more often. Uh, he's been Nashville's best player in these first two games. And I like what he did after the game as far as, you know, just, you know, kind of breeding that confidence with his teammates. And it's easier to do when you're the best player on the ice. I like the fact that he wrestled the round, if you want to call it that, at the end of the game with Evgeny Malkin. I mean, you're talking about two superstars going at it. This guy is an ultimate competitor, and he wants to win. And, you know, this is, this is new for a lot of these guys. And I think you're seeing that a little bit with Nashville. The only one that has any Stanley Cup uh, finals experience is Mike Fisher. And he took a stupid penalty last night, yeah. which I think, you know, affected the game a little bit. But I think you're seeing a team that's playing with some nerves. They're making some of the mistakes that you don't normally see from this team. You saw it early on in that third period. A couple, you know, pinches and, and forwards not getting back kind of caught sleeping a little bit. But I think once they get back, if I'm Nashville, I pick up the phone, I call up Garth Brooks, and I say, listen, Garth, I'm going to need you to sing the anthem. We need this one. And I'm sure Smashville uh, throwing catfish and everything else. That catfish <laughs> that that guy threw in Pittsburgh, it looked like Shaq's foot. Yeah. 
but he didn't, he didn't get arrested for it. Boy, you're right about Garth Brooks. One of those stars. I know Luke Bryan is saying there, Lady Annabellum, certainly Carrie Underwood has as well. they got to pull out all the stops. Garth Brooks would be a good one. And, and boy, with Subban, I mean, you saw him trying to get his little shots in on, on Crosby. Then he took a stick, did a PK to the side of the head as well in a penalty-filled first period. What outside of their goalie? What else do they need to do? Because while Renee certainly made some mistakes, there was also some good passing and some open net to shoot at as well. So it's more than just the goalie here for Nashville. What else, where else do they need to improve? Well, you know what, Mike? What's interesting with Nashville is they generate a lot of their offense. Almost 40% of their offense comes from the defensemen. And now if you're one of the Nashville defensemen and you see Sidney Crosby, you see Phil Kessel, you see Evgeny Malkin – coming your way all the time, you're probably more hesitant to jump up in the play because whenever you do or whenever you turn the puck over, it seems like it ends up in the back of your net. So I think really no one was – I think we are kind of underselling how much the loss of Ryan Johansson was going to be for this team as far as he was leading the team in, in points before he gets hurt. He's their number one center. And when you start talking about which teams have won Stanley Cups or, or most successful in the playoffs, you look at depth at the center position. Now, you know, Pittsburgh wasn't very good in the faceoffs last night, but when you can throw Sidney Crosby um, – you know, Evgeny Malkin, and then you got Benino, who's, I heard you guys talking about the shot he blocked. Oh. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Jake the Snake Gensel was on the fourth line, was almost a healthy scratch in game one. He gets the game winner, starts this game on the third line, scores, and then by the end of the game, he gets the game winner again, and he's back on the first line with Sidney Crosby. So right now, Mike Sullivan's pushing all the right buttons. If Nashville wants to get back in this series, they have, I mean, they're getting the shots. They're going to need more traffic in front. They're going to have to make Matt Murray uncomfortable. Right now, he's, he's too comfortable in the net. I mean, he is, and it's one of the reasons I think that they replaced. Uh, Mark andre Fleury, who was, for my money, probably one of the best goalies in the playoffs before he got replaced by Matt Murray, is because he's so calm and there's so, there's so little movement to his game. He doesn't rely on athleticism, and I think you saw that last night, especially late in that first period where Nashville kind of threw everything they had at him, and he made a big left pad save on, on, on Philip Forsberg. But this is the kind of traffic we're talking about. You know, Benino, uh, these guys are unbelievable, man. As a former goalie, I can't tell you how much I appreciate these guys doing this. You always used to take them out to dinner and buy them gifts or whatever because <laughs> it takes – I'll tell you what, man, that puck hurts when you have goalie pads on. Never mind when you just have a, a forward skate and you get hit in the ankle bone with it. I'm telling you, I saw that, Rick, and I thought, oh, my God, I, I don't know. And, and he comes back. I mean, I've always said hockey players are the toughest, toughest athletes out there. So where does a player – nobody wants to get hit by a puck and stay and, and, and leave the, the neck and, and head area out of it. I'm sure they, – and they want it to hit their pad. But if it's going to – where's the, the shot that hurts the most? I, that, that players say where they get hit because I saw that I thought the dude's ankle was broken after that one on the shot he took but where do guys nobody wants to get hit but where's the spot that hurts the most well especially after how he reacted right like he couldn't put any weight on it they have to <laughs> carry him off the ice you'll see a lot of guys now Mike that actually have plastic uh plastic pieces over their skates guys that kill penalties to protect their foot inside of the foot is is bad but for my money when you get hit and you'll know this Mike just above your kneecap your VMO that little muscle above your kneecap when you get hit with the puck right on that muscle, I mean, it is, it's lights out. You can't bend your leg. You're walking around like a pirate for the next two weeks. But <laughs> you know what? Playoff hockey, man, it's Stanley Cup Finals, whatever it takes to get back on the ice. And, again, listen, I know we're talking about the NBA playoffs here, and they're coming up tonight. We'll start the finals tonight. But for my money, the best playoffs in all the sports is the NHL. NHL playoffs is definitely a marathon, and you're right. It's a war of attrition when it comes to the endurance that all these guys show out there and all the stamina. Rick DiPietro, the former hockey goalie, of course, of the Islanders, now the co-host of Han, Humpty, and Canty, 98.7 ESPN New York, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Really appreciate the insight, Rick. Take care. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it, guys. And add in, I wore my uh, Stars and Stripes tee today. I was going to say, proud American. I could see there that. There you go. I was going to say, Jay Kentel, that's been a boon for USA Hockey. Yeah, I noticed, you... I noticed you're we the North Hold on, add in. Let me, get my, let me get my Jake Kentel stats out of my American <laughs> fanny pack. Listen, uh, hey, bottom line is you still need a Canadian in Sidney Crosby, the pride of Cole Harbor, Nova Scotia, to take <laughs> oh, it to the province. Man. Land. Thank you, Rick. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um... I know this, I know this, I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. Bill and Owen, congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. This is the captain, Adnan Verk, alongside Golik. In for Greening today, Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. Coming up. 10 to 15 minutes from now, we'll get into some NFL convo here. Yes. Mike, it's interesting. FPI ranks released here as well. 
Apparently, Brock Osweiler looks great in mm, Cleveland. So they say. So we'll get in that uh-huh. in a second. But unfortunate story here with LeBron James, the fact that there was the N-word was spray painted outside of his house in Brentwood. Of course, he's readying for the NBA Finals tonight. But it's just another reminder that just because you're a star athlete in this country, you still have all the challenges and all the racism that any African-American faces. And I think he's really come out strongly against it, obviously speaking with Rachel Nichols about it. And once again, is uh, somebody who's unafraid to tackle social issues. I, I think, yes, exactly right. In, in we've seen over the last decades, we've seen some uh, African-American athletes and like Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods that, that people criticize them for not speaking out on issues. And again, you have the right to do whatever you want. If you, you can or you can't, depending on your situation. And LeBron has not shied away from that, you know, when the situation has, has come up. And he certainly didn't hear uh, as well. And, and it does show that, boy, it really doesn't matter your status. Again, this is an area where I you know, can't speak of at, at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, Le- LeBron does not have a problem speaking about it and, and, and what the ramifications of it could be. He spoke to Rachel Nichols about the incident and how he's handling it with his family. Surprising, no. Um, because I understand, I still understand how race plays a huge part in America. And um, for me to be sitting here on the eve of the finals, one of the biggest sporting events in the world, and I have to answer questions about racism. Um, it just lets me know that that is still here, and, and we should all know that. And and if it takes for someone to spray paint my gate and use that derogatory term, that hate on um, on my family to shed a light on what the real issue is in the world, then so be it. And I think, and I sit here and say that I believe that's why. It, you know, women like Emmett Till's mom left the casket open and showed everybody in the world what her son went through mm-hmm. because of hate. You know, so, you know, I look at it and um, and it hurts and it's like unfortunate and I got to sit here and I got to talk to my kids about what it means to grow up being an African-American, a black kid in America. Um, if that can shed light on the whole situation and we can continue the conversation uh, because no matter how no matter how much money you got, no matter how famous you are, no matter how many people admire you, at the end of the day, being a black man in America is uh, is very frightening, and it lets us know that we got so much farther, so much further to go to be equal in this in this country. You know, a, a guy not afraid to say, "Listen, let's let's use this if we can, if it furthers discussion." Here he is, one of the most popular athletes in the world, mm-hmm. one of the more recognizable people in the world and you know this it, this you know racial situ- r- racial slur in this situation happens to him so i i'm sure he was upset about it as he said he wishes he could you know ex- talk, be with his kids and explain it to them and such mm-hmm. but he does you know i i like how he and and i know he got a lot of kudos for this about pushing it forward and say okay it happened I'm certainly not happy it happened by any stretch of the imagination but okay so this is we're still here you know, how do we get to the next level, you know, through more discussion and listening and, and, and whatever it's going to take. Yeah, that's the ultimate challenge here is you try to take a negative into a positive. Like you said earlier, if you can see a silver lining in this, right. draw attention to the fact that race is still a really important issue in this country and unfortunately remains something very polarizing. And just because of the fact of his wealth or attention, that that's not uh, something that he's not immune from. And we were mentioning earlier the ESPN top 100 athletes in the yes. world. LeBron James, I mean, this is a global phenomenon. The fact he's only number two on that list behind Ronaldo. Yeah. You think about how huge soccer is, 38 soccer players in that top 100. But LeBron really is the pinnacle for sports, yes, not is. only in this country, but around the world. Yeah, he absolutely is. So I, I think that's why he's saying, basically, if it can happen to me, gang, you know, then, you know, they're, they're, it's not like the issue's going away. Right. Can we say it's better than how many decades ago? I'm sure that there's, there's a progression, but... You know, as he said, you know, he feels, and, and others as well, that there's still certainly a ways to go. Bomani Jones is always very outspoken. He is always insightful when it comes to issues of race in this country. The right time with Bomani Jones. Here's Monday the Friday, 47 Eastern on ESPN Radio. Here's Bomani's thoughts on what happened to LeBron James. Even you, LeBron James, you can't rich yourself out of this. You can't move to some sort of neighborhood to get away from this. Because if I, look, if I pay $21 million for a house, I feel like I should feel pretty confident that people ain't going to be spray painting my stuff. That not come, like, d- d- does that not come with the price of a ticket? I would think. $21 million. I would think, no, I don't have to worry about people coming through spray painting my stuff. 
I can't believe anybody can honestly get close enough to LeBron's gate being in that neighborhood. Like, it's, it, this is like, to me, a legitimately shocking story to come across. Now, again, I, I don't, you know, the, the gate has a, a gate in front of the house. He doesn't live there. It's another house he has in, in L.A. And the, mm-hmm. the fan, they spend some time there. I don't know the neighborhood to know, uh, get in and out. But there was a surveillance camera, and they believe there, I, we, they all believe there's footage of it. So if that helps mm-hmm. them catch the person, then great. But, you know, there it is again. As, as he said, rich can't, you can't rich yourself out of this. And that, that was LeBron's point as well of, of them really both then making the point of, you know, there, there's a ways to go here when where where this can affect you. No doubt about it. The good news is that at least, like you said, there should be surveillance tapes. So hopefully they catch the culprit. Uh, he is dealt with, and we can focus on the actual task of LeBron James being great on a basketball court tonight. Once again, the NBA Finals uh, coverage begins 8 Eastern on ESPN Radio, 830 on ABC. You know, g- really quick, going back to that, I was still interested in Scottie Pippen. I gave Scottie, we had him on earlier, and I gave him the 10 starters from both teams and mm-hmm. said, pick your starting five. And were you surprised that, that he went he won yeah. four Golden State Warriors? Clay Thompson surprised me. Clay, a bit. He went Clay, Steph, KD, and Draymond and LeBron as his starting five. I said, You got the ten players. Mm-hmm. I said I went old school, you know, uh, middle school on the on the playground. Yeah. You pick your players. And he picked those five. Because I've heard a lot of people do the let's do a draft if you get the first pick and then you go back and forth mm-hmm. on which players get picked. Right. But I just let him pick the five. Four Golden State Warriors. I, I was a little surprised. Clay Thompson's had a disappointing postseason. Has not shot the ball particularly well. Uh, the Warriors haven't needed him, which just shows how strong their team is. So you're right. I, I would have thought maybe Kyrie Irving. Kevin Love has been sensational for Cleveland. Obviously, if they win this finals, it's going to be more than LeBron James. He has yep. to be the X factor. He's got to play above average defense, and he's got to continue to shoot at the high clip, which he's done. And, and a guy, you know, wasn't one of the seven all stars out there, and isn't a name that we had talked about. Tristan Thompson's huge. Yes, even to be able to take care of the boards, especially on the offensive side, to give those second and third uh, uh, tries. The best of Mike and Mike. Adnan Verk in for Greeny. We're Mike and Mike. Great to have you with us here on Thursday. We're on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. We're presented by Progressive Insurance and all of our phone guests in the Shell Penzo Performance Line alongside Golik. We are thrilled because we're going to finally get the NBA oh. Finals. <laughs> Warriors right now are favored in five. Uh, Mike and I will give our official predictions at the end of this right. hour. Cavaliers, though, a fighting chance. We'll see what happens. But, hey, I'm just happy. We're finally going to have meaningful basketball again. And let's just hope it's more competitive well, than the conference. I mean, that, that's going to be the whole thing. We all believed this was coming. We were all just about sure it was coming since July 4th and Kevin Durant's decision. Mm-hmm. Now it needs to live up. There's been a lot of ripping of the basketball season, which I think is can be a bit unfair, mm-hmm. especially when you look at what do you look at the test you know, what, what a season has done. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing you have to look at in mass is ratings, right? Yep. Ratings were basically flat during the regular season, which in this day and age is up. That's a win, yeah. And, and they're and, up in the playoffs. And, the, and then we go to the playoffs and they were up. Mm-hmm. And we know the sport is making money hand over fist yeah. with what the players are being paid. So does that mean it's all successful? I, you know, there, there are more factors. Obviously, there wasn't a lot of competition in the playoffs, but people still watch. But still, we're to the point now where, okay, we all got the finals that we want. Now, is it going to live up? You know, is who and who does this mean more? In your mind, is Golden State, while the players won't think that, nor should they, mm. not, not at all. You win a championship, you win a championship, you hoist a trophy, and you'd be proud of it. Right. But in a general sense, we always start to talk about who does this mean more to? You know, so from Golden State side, are they in an almost no win situation? I They're think so. so Heavily favored in this. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to win it. You had a 73-win team last year that did lose in the finals, Mm -hmm. but you added Kevin Durant. You're the best team in basketball right now. You're heavily favored. So if you win, it's like, okay. Yeah. And God forbid you lose. Now you are the best team in basketball. You add Kevin Durant, and you lose. So, boy, what a feather in the cap for LeBron James. But from Golden State side, boy, that's – I I, so I wonder from a – from a – perception standpoint, how that will work for them. Yeah, it's amazing, Mike, how the narrative has shifted. We're going to get to Brian Windhorst in just a second. But you're right. The fact that three years ago the Warriors were a breath of fresh air. God, there's so much fun to watch. So exciting. Steph Curry electrifying offensively. All these three-pointers. A jump-shooting team going to the finals. And now you go, all right, they already were the best. Then they add this mercenary in Durant. Now LeBron James, who's been so vilified in the past, now he's the hero that America needs. It now really is. What you want. Yeah, for, for how he was hated going to Miami. You right. know, now 
it's now he's like, okay, yeah. you know, can he knock off this new bully on the block? And right. for LeBron, the talk is, boy, if he pulls this one off, yeah. man, in some people's eyes, he's right there with Michael Jordan. He's he's ready to, to make that move if he can keep this going for another couple of years. But, boy, the feather in the cap for this one. Yeah, I don't think he's quite in the GOAT conversation yet, but you're right. If he pulls this off, it would be incredible. Let's bring in Brian Winhorst, ESPN NBA insider and co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Return of the King. Brian's joining us in the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Brian, thanks so much for coming on. Let's start with LeBron then. How meaningful would this be if he can pull off the incredible and knock off the big bad Warriors? Yeah, I think you guys are close to what I think is right, which is it's kind of a free roll for him. Um, he wins. It's considered an incredible upset, and he loses. And, you know, he gets horsewhipped for being 3-5 three in the three and five in the finals, but you know, uh, he's been an underdog in the – this is his eighth final. He's been an underdog six of the eight times. This is a thing that he's done. He, he's, he's generally played on the weaker team, although when you think of that, how could that be possible considering his, uh, his team they had in Miami? But it's true. Um, he's been the underdog most years. This has been uh, a situation he's overcome three times. All three times he won the finals, they were an underdog. So um, I do think – it, he plays up to it a little bit. I mean, one of the things he said immediately after the Cavs won in Boston last week was, hey, they've been the best team for the last three years. You know, they're going to be a huge challenge. They're, the, they're far and away the, the, the best team in the league right now. And I think he did that knowing that every statement like that removes pressure from him and puts it on the Warriors. Well, and that's what we always talk about is who has more pressure on them. And both these teams obviously want to win, so there's pressure on both of them. But going off of what I said before you came on, do you think there is more pressure on Golden State in the position they're in? I do. Be, I can really relate to where the, uh, the, 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 the Warriors are right now because I was there every single day in Miami uh, that first year when LeBron arrived. And the circumstances were a little bit different because it was one player arriving instead of the whole team being new. And and generally the Warriors are like, yes, they receive some blowback now where they received none, uh, you know, two years ago. But generally they're a pretty well-liked team. As I go around the country, I see a lot of Steph Curry and Kevin Durant jerseys. Um, but – I can understand their situation. It's an all or nothing for them. You know, once they signed Durant, they lost really any excuse making ability. And they were willing to trade that. That, you know, they were, their eyes were wide open. In fact, I would argue that it's not been as bad as they thought it would be. They thought the, the criticism and the hate that they would get was worse than it was. So they knew when they, when they all made that deal, when I mean all of them came together, the Hamptons Five all sat together, they knew that this is what they were signing up for. And if they come through and deliver, I, I promise you they'll, they'll say it was worth it. Indeed. Brian Windhorst right now joining us in the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. To tonight specifically, Steve Kerr, Ramona Shelburne reporting, Brian could be back for the Warriors on the sidelines. I don't want to diminish it because clearly they're 12-0 and without him, but he's been involved with practices. He's there at halftime. Uh, and I think if it's a key game late, I want him drawing up a play X's and O's wise. What do you think? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Steve, you know, gave a really good interview to Tim Kawakami um, of the Bay Area News Group uh, earlier this week where he said that there's going to be some matchup challenges in this series that are going to be very challenging on the coaching staff, that they're going to really have to pay attention to it. Um, and I think maybe that's, you know, Steve wants to be out there for that, not necessarily because he doesn't think – his coaches and Mike Brown can can handle it, but because I think he understands that uh, having your hand on the joystick on the sideline in this series is going to be really important. Uh, from what I understand in, in in talking to people around the Warriors, the most important thing to Steve has been uh, he doesn't want to start and then have to stop because he cause he thinks that's a distraction for the team. So that's a that's going to be a factor in this. Can he feel like he's physically able to coach uh, all the way through maybe that's an unanswerable question um, I do think it's a little bit of a distraction for the Warriors if it's unsettled but ultimately this team is so good and they have such a great relationship with their coaching staff I think either way the team is going to be okay 100% agree on, on Steve Kerr not wanting to start and stop so we wanted to make sure that if he can be out there he can be out there for the duration the one thing 
is athletes always try and certainly coaches try to limit distractions. And with LeBron James, we know when he goes the old zero dark 30 and just goes off of social media and puts basically puts the phone away and such once the playoffs start. Well, I mean, certainly that was added to that pile of having to talk about something else with the vandalism at his place uh, in L.A. and having to deal with that and the word that was spray painted on his gate. I, I wouldn't imagine there would be, but how do you think that plays into this for a guy that really puts everything else away once the playoffs start? Well, he was definitely down yesterday, um, and that's not the way you want you know, uh, the, the day before the finals is usually the best day because while there's some nervousness and stuff, uh, it's zero zero. You know, there's you know nobody's behind. It's it's uh, you know it's like the first day of school. Nobody has homework yet. So um, his demeanor was so uh, injured yesterday, and uh, and I felt that. And so he's going to have to challenge to um, to come out of that. But you know, it, it's so amazing. You know, the, the way LeBron has positioned himself to be able to speak on these issues and do so with such grace. You know, last year, Muhammad Ali passed away uh, during the finals here in Golden State, during the, the games one and two. And his eloquence in discussing what Muhammad Ali meant to him and also the way he paved the way for him was remarkable. And yesterday, to come to the podium and speak about the historical significance uh, of an anniversary with uh, Emmett Till um, was, I mean, he educated me yesterday uh, walking up to that podium. Uh, so while he definitely shuts himself off a little bit from media, he's also somebody who understands how important what he says is in the media. He understands his reach. He knows that yesterday it wasn't just going to be ESPN and the local television outlets there. He knew that CNN was going to be there. He knew that the BBC was going to be there. He knew that CNBC from Canada was going to be there and that his comments would be broadcast across the world. He was keenly aware of that, and he stepped up and was ready with something important to say. And I think that's remarkable about LeBron. He's developed that, and I don't think he gets enough credit at times for just how he handles these situations because everybody expected him to be able to comment on that yesterday, and most people would probably prefer to internalize something that was that uh, negative. He certainly was eloquent on the topic. Adnan Verk in for Greeny. It's Mike and Mike on ESPN Radio and ESPN 2. We're talking with Brian Windhorst right now on the Shell Penzoil Performance Line. Yesterday, Kyrie Irving spoke about some of the regrets he had, Brian, while playing under then-coach Mike Brown, who's the interim coach of the Warriors. What did he speak about specifically? Yeah, uh, I thought this was interesting. It was it was sort of unprompted. He was just asked about Mike Brown. Um, you know, it's easy to forget that Mike Brown was the head coach of this of the, a couple of the players on this team right before LeBron James came back, and his relationship with Kyrie was terrible. It was so bad that during that season, Mike Brown advocated for the Cavs to trade Kyrie Irving. And the, one of the reasons why the Cavs fired Mike Brown after one season with $20 million left on his contract was because they were concerned that if he remained the coach, that Kyrie would not sign a contract extension with the team, which he ended up doing. But that was a concern in it. That's how rocky and how bad their relationship uh, did. And, and, and Mike Brown is, is not going to say anything negative about the Cavs, and that's partially because he's, a, he's generally a positive person. But the other reason is the Cavs are paying him through 2020, and I think he's got a clause in his contract that he can't disparage them. Um, but Kyrie certainly is not bound by that. And Kyrie said yesterday he regretted the way it went with he and Mike Brown and that he was 21 at the time and he was headstrong and he wasn't uh, you know, necessarily willing to listen and that it was a learning experience. And, look, Kyrie may have great points. The reasons that he feuded with Mike Brown, Kyrie may end up being right because the way that Kyrie plays today – is really not the way Mike Brown wanted him to play. Kyrie has sort of been vindicated on that. But having said that, for him to step up there and make that statement, I think shows that Kyrie is also maturing and looking back and realizing the mistakes that he made in the past. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would like it'd be interesting in that conversation when Mike Brown was coaching the Cavs and actually floated to management. Maybe we should trade Kyrie and then go. Well, it wasn't like that. I think. Okay. Just, just for a point, I think I think it was going really really badly with Kyrie that year. He really took a step back, regress wise. And they got some calls about him, and I think they had a meeting, and Mike was like, you know what, I wouldn't stand in your way. I think that's the fairer way to say it. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Defense first type. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, As far as LeBron and history, you know, there's 
all the talk now of LeBron and comparing to Michael Jordan and would this make him closer, how much closer if he were to win this series. You've been around LeBron more than anybody. How much is he aware of his surroundings, knowing full well that he can't make the decision who the greatest is ever? All he can do is provide the ammunition for others to make that. How aware uh, is he of that situation and what he's playing for? He's the most aware person I've ever covered. His awareness of his place in the day, in the season, in the history of the game is, in my experience, unmatched. It's probably one of his most incredible traits. So he is extremely aware of it. But he had such a, his his speaking on Jordan last week when he passed him in the scoring race was as as um, transparent as he's ever been on the topic. And I really think that we should all take a, take a clue from him. He said that he is driven by Michael Jordan personally, that when he's got to get up and do workouts in August, uh, that, that, that he thinks about Jordan, that when he's you know sore and tired and wants to take time off during the season, he thinks about Jordan, that when he's down in a series um, and, and wants to let it go, that he thinks about Jordan. He doesn't think about Jordan as somebody he has to catch. He's a motivating factor, but he recognizes that he is something that, that he can never fully achieve. And I think we should just take that and go with it and understand that that's the way he feels about it. That's the way he looks at it. And basically what he said is, I'm opting out of the comparison discussion. I don't want to be compared. I just want him to drive me. And I, don't, I can't think of a better way to look at it. I know it doesn't make – good television and radio when we have to do it to talk about it like that. But honestly, I thought his guidance on that was very well thought out, and, and I agree with it. Making it clear how much it matters to him. Talking right now with Brian Windhorst on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. How about Steph Curry then, Brian? Because on the other side of it, this is a guy who's an electrifying player, but, God, people love to try to turn and take down a guy after he's the best player of a team that was up 3-1, they lose game seven, he was not strong, had a poor performance, and then they load up and they get Kevin Durant. What do you make? I find it silly The people were saying that Steph Curry is something to prove after last year's finals. Steph Curry has two, two MVPs. <laughs> if you have two MVPs, you don't have much left to prove, and he's also got a ring. Um, you know, he, he did not play well in last year's finals, and he, he was good but not great in the finals two years ago. The Cavs have given him, you know, in air quotes, problems because he still put up really good numbers. He hasn't put up his best numbers against the Cavs. Um, and so I do think that if he struggles at all, that will be brought back. But I also think that and this is another remarkable stat that just LeBron creates these stats that are just so stunning. The last five finals MVPs have either been LeBron or the guy guarding LeBron. <laughs> uh, Iguodala and, and, and Kawhi Leonard. So <laughs> when LeBron is in the series, he's so all-consuming, and he sets such an incredible standard, and there's so much focus on him, and I think it's going to be a Durant-LeBron series um, that I think that Steph may actually benefit from not having as much focus on him. But Steph Curry doesn't have to prove anything to me or anybody else. No doubt about that. I'm with you on that. Brian Windhorst, ESPN NBA insider, co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Return of the King. Appreciate the insight. Enjoy the game tonight. Thanks, Wendy. Take care, guys. You know, what's interesting there is, is what he said about LeBron and Michael Jordan. And, and I get it. It's certainly, and I guess one of the reasons to say that, and, and it could very well be true, that I don't, I'm taking myself out of the running of being compared to him. Uh, he just motivates me. Mm -hmm. But that's also a good thing to say because you're not going to be the one that compares to him. You're not – when people – LeBron's not the guy that says, hey, LeBron, you think you're better than Michael Jordan? Yeah, I think I am, or if I win this, I'm going to get close. He knows that's up to everybody else. Right. So that, that he's not going to make that decision, and, and if he goes out there and says, I am, then he knows they'll get kind of crushed for it. That's a decision for all of everybody else to make. It's for when he's done. As Scottie Pippen said, let LeBron finish his career. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's playing now, so it's fun to talk about. Right. But then, then we kind of go over everything, and it'll be up to – more public opinion than LeBron. LeBron can finish his career and think that he was a better player than Michael Jordan. I highly doubt you'll ever hear him say that mm -hmm. because others will 
decide that when they make their lists. As I said, all he can do is provide the ammunition. And while he's not going to be 6-0 and in finals, you know, what if he's 5-6? and You know, what if he goes to 11 finals, you know, and mm-hmm. wins five? What if he falls one ring short but goes to five more finals? I mean, that's where people start, you know, separating or wondering, you know, is that – it goes back again, I, and I agree to that, to the Tom Brady of – Tom Brady, before he won his fifth, he was 4-2, and two, which would be better than 4-0, and oh, right? Right. I mean, <laughs> uh, Greeny made that point, and at first I kind of like, no, you're undefeated, you know, but then I'm like – No, six, well, yeah, you yeah. got the six Super Bowls. Mm-hmm. I mean, so so you would actually be if you held four and two against Tom Brady, you would actually be be critical of him for winning an AFC championship game, right, you know, to get to the Super Bowl and then lose it. It doesn't make sense. So there is. It's fun to talk about now, but there is obviously it needs to see where this thing ends up because I I don't think there's any doubt LeBron has a, could have a few more years of this. Michael Jordan went ten and four in NBA Finals games as an underdog. LeBron James seven and sixteen. Brian Windhorst mentioned the fact he was transparent in talking about legacies. Here is LeBron about how Michael Jordan motivates him. I never really talk about my legacy. Um, I kind of just live in the moment, and if I'm able to accomplish something, then it kind of adds to it on its own. Um, so in this instance, you know, I've seen some of the um, some of the stats and some of the history and things of that nature, and um, you know, I'm the first person to go to the final seven straight times since. I think uh, Bill Russell and those guys back in the 50s, I believe, or 60s. And, uh, and I think I was the first guy to take a franchise, um, two different franchises to the finals four times. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, I, I want to be able to, once I hang it up and not play this game anymore, that people can look at what I was able to accomplish, win, lose, or draw, and say that he made a difference. Yeah, there's no reason for him to hide what he wants to have. I understand sure. why every time you don't want to put it out there, yeah. like, okay, enough yeah. of the LeBron-Jordan right. conversations. But he didn't duck the question, which I like about LeBron. Yeah, he doesn't. doesn't. And, and again, a win in this series against this Golden State team, I think would maybe, as I said, some people will make him surpass. I know you're not there. I don't know if I'm there as well. I, I yeah. still think you let it play out because there's obviously time to go. But, right. you know, he's, he's on the right path. There ain't no doubt about that. Yeah, right <laughs> now I, I say Jordan, like, unequivocal number one. If, if LeBron was to win, Mike, at least I'd say it's in the conversation. And, and again, there are those I've been hearing more and more people saying, wait a minute, LeBron's not even past Kobe yet. Right. You know, and, and quite honestly, I see others who said, wait, is Kobe even past Tim Duncan? Yeah, I mean that's you know, the thing. I mean, if you really want to, if you really want to streamline it, you almost go separate. You go the big guys in a separate category: Duncan and Russell and Kareem. Although that's not the debate. The debate is who's yeah, the best, best of all player. time. So yeah, then yeah, it makes things more trickier.